job, Alan. Pretty rough. You know, we've had so many transit workers die. Uh, I don't know what to say. And, um, you know, it's usually people in their 50s and 60s and uh, people with, yeah. he with it's, it's people with a very well-built upper body, it seems. A lot of people have that physique. They are dying. I mean, we have about 65 transit workers. What are you saying, like muscular or just like? Uh, I would say kind of big, kind of heavy. Um, but maybe they have reduced lung capacity, perhaps. Hi, Kevin. Good oh, to see you. Uh, yeah. Hi, Alan. Yeah, so that's... Uh, Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. And I've been writing... Hey, how you writing, doing, writing, Kevin? Uh, good, good. I'm trying to adjust the audio here. Sorry. <laughs> hey, how you doing, man? All right. Rita, is that you? Who's that down there? So has it become like a bunch of squares? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like Hollywood Squares, right? You remember that show? Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, hi Rita. Squares. Rita. Hi, Frank, it's good to see you. Yeah, um, Kevin, this background at the center back in 1980 or so. Oh. This is Eva's, the path to Eva's cottage, if you could see it. Oh, nice. Very nice. Uh, I took that picture from my old, uh, that was of course a, not a digital, that was a, I took that on film and I made it. Oh, that's it pretty. Island. Oh, that's a picture that you took, Alan? I did. Oh, wow. I thought it was like some kind of uh, picture you bought. No, so no, it's yours. myself. It's yours. So. Nice. How did you get it so big? Well, because it's all about the magic of the computer. Frank, it's, it's about, uh, <laughs> it's just the way the software works. It's, it's wow. not that, it's only, it's, well, it's, I don't know how to put it. It's, it's about the size of an index card, but it looks big. It's so cool. <laughs> oh, I didn't well, know you could sub it out. Okay, you do that on Zoom. Nice. <clears throat> so how's it going, man, Kevin? Doing well, Frank. Yeah, you know? good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, staying busy through the craziness, but uh, staying Family, occupied. Family, everybody's good. Yeah, yeah. So both kids are home and uh, learning from home with school and stuff. But everyone's uh, everyone seems to be, you know, doing well. Just uh, adjusting to the new routine is all really on our end. So nothing to I be, know. You, know, it's know, rough. It's rough. you know, it's okay. It's all right. You know, yeah. we try to get out for walks as much as possible to the middle school and stuff like that. But um, but we're well. Thanks for asking. Good, good. How about yourself? How are you feeling? <clears throat> I could be feeling better, but I'm hanging in there. I'm going through all these treatments, and it's like yeah. a, a big long saga of uh, ups and downs. But yeah, coming to the end, I'm gonna be getting some uh, X-rays or something, and maybe looking around to see what's going on. Well, I'm really happy that you can join us today. Yeah, man. I, I was here the last time, but I didn't know how to work everything. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got the video going. Yeah. Great to see you. You too. You know? bro. It's been a long time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Tracy. Okay. All right. Tracy, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can we see you? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, are you on your iPhone or are you on a I am on. I'm on my iPhone. Uh, there should be a way. Hold on. Hey, Alan. Uh, hold on. on. Yeah, hold on. Maybe, hold on. Keith, there I am. I Hello. See. I see. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys? Good. Alan, you all better? I am, thanks. I did have fever for a couple of days. Uh, I had an intermittent fever, and uh, about three days ago, went away. So, and I know that... Oh. Uh, Tracy, you had you had the virus, right? I I I I if I didn't have it, I had its uh, identical cousin because I I had every single symptom that they talk about. I was very 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 sick for one month. Wow. Hmm. Did it just recently start lifting, Tracy? No, no. I was sick from the middle of uh, January to the middle of February. Oh my. Wow. I didn't know it at the time because it was before everything was identified, but 
now when I'm looking back. So you had fever and loss of taste and smell I'll and, get that in. and everything like that? Yep. 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 Every single symptom. Huh. Yep. Classic, exactly the way they describe it. Hitting all of a sudden, you know, and, t and then I had a fever for a month, lost my taste of sense and smell, had a sore throat, cough for a month. It was oh, wow. really bad. But I'm really happy I got it because, you know, I want the antibodies. Yeah. Did you have the breathing problem? Yep. Every single symptom. In fact, oh, the, fir lucky. the first night I was so sick. It was the sickest I've ever been in my life. I almost woke Joel up and said, you've got to take me to the emergency room. Oh, wow. So, wow. but I'm like, yeah, I'm really happy I had it though. Cause you know, well, I'm not sure because I haven't had the test, but like I said, I either had it or I had its identical cousin. <laughs> but, you know, living here in New York City, um, you know, it's it just, it, Joel and I go out every day for hours and miles of walking to uh, hand out money and sandwiches to the homeless. So it, it gives me some degree of comfort to at least believe that I have already had it. Heavy duty. Wow. Well, um, A. Sid, you re recognize this picture behind me here. You recognize that? That's from the center. That's the path to Eva's cottage. That's a photograph that's well, I'll put it in, in my background. Here. I lost your I lost your image. Oh, you see you see the background. There you are. What is it, Alan? The background. You see the background? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the path down to the uh, barn. Correct, correct. All right, friends. Well, I guess we should talk about our lecture uh, today. And mm. uh, well, this lecture is like a, I don't know, a thunderbolt. Fabulous, fabulous lecture. I always say that about every lecture, but, um, you know, um, I was very struck by the question and answer about prayer on page eight, you know. Um, if I can just kind of jump in and talk about that for a minute. The um, question, I have a recently learned of a young cousin who has a malignancy, and I would like to ask that I have the prayer of this group for his recovery, and I would like to know if there's anything I could do or what can be done to help him. Guy says, my dearest, this question is so very contradictory to everything I have said tonight and previously. It is certainly understandable you feel that way. Of course, you and the whole group can pray, but... The guide makes the point, you know, that um, prayers to intercede in someone else's life can never, can never be productive. And that everyone's own task, you have to meet what you experience in your life as a manifestation of your own task. So the idea that, um, that we have to pray that's for somebody to get better and that in some sense, we're interfering with somebody else's path and their own recognitions. That's quite a, a radical point of view, really. And I was kind of struck by that question. And of course, a lot of it has to do with what exactly suffering is and, and what, um, what loss is. And of course, if you look at it from the guide's point of view, suffering is temporary and so is loss. Um, he says, Temporary suffering, parting, and death is in reality not what it means, is in reality not what it means to you. I know this is painful at the, this moment in time. So I was kind of meditating on the guy's answer. Such a commonplace thing, and we always are praying for everyone else, but you know, in some sense, the path work is a way for us to find our inner reality in a deeper fashion so that we can then fashion our reality through our consciousness. Well, let's, I want, let's, so let's recap and talk about the lecture itself. Um, the lecture has to do with man's relationship to God in five stages. And then in the questions and answers, the guide gets into prayer, what prayer is. And also talks about very similar stages about prayer. Um, you know, how one relates to prayer, what, what the meaning of prayer is. And I guess it makes sense that 
you know, the God, the idea of what God, who God is, or how the relationship to God goes along with the relationship to prayer. So the guy talks about um, the five stages of relationship to God. And I'll just recap that. The first stage is where somebody doesn't really have a concept of God, isn't thinking about anything except survival. So, I mean, the guide says, the guide says um, primitive man or early man or the early consciousness, all you're doing is trying to survive. You're not, con you're not conscious of anything else other than trying to meet your own needs. Um, in the second stage, um, where you have a little mo bit more, um, I suppose, uh, comfort, people are overwhelmed by an awe of nature and of what appears to be um, a divine, um, divine spirit in nature. I think that all of us have felt that way in nature, you know, that there's something awful, wonderful, that is awesome, awesome. amazing about nature. And so then the second stage is when one feels a presence and then one feels worshipful toward that presence. Now in the third, right? So far so good. Uh, in the third stage, that's, um, that's kind of where the, the trouble happens. Then once we become, once we build civilization and build relationships and create groups, all of a sudden, guess what happens? We have a lower self and we start hearing the impulses of our lower self. And we have to build the defense against that, which is the mask self. And then all of a sudden the ego gets involved. So the guide says, um, we try to build, then we, we, we look at God as an authority that we project our hopes and our fears onto. Our relationship with God, he says, is based on personal needs, on wishful thinking and on fear. And the more this proceeds, the guide says, the falser the concept of God becomes. In the end, it will become a superstition with less truth and more dogma. He says, this makes a farce out of God. So then God becomes such a punishing and artificial image that our intelligence rebels against it. And our intelligence says, hey, wait a second. I am not going to project all of my hopes and my fears onto this, onto this God. I have the ability. I don't have to believe in this God. I can believe in myself and my own authority and my own responsibility. So then the fourth stage of atheism, where then the person says, hey, look, I cannot believe in this completely artificial, fraudulent image of God that I would previously have to kowtow to, try to appease, uh, try to bargain with, try to cajole, and instead I'm going to rely on myself. So that is the first stage of atheism. And it's good. The good part about it is, as the guide says, it makes a person free of the expectation of being rewarded for obedience to rules. It frees us of the fear of being punished. And so it brings us in some ways back to ourselves. And that's where the path works begins, right? Because once we are able to be free of the concept of a punishing God or a God that we have to appease, where else is there to look? Then the only place to look is within, the reality within. And that is where the path work happens, where we encounter ourselves. And in being sensitive and receptive to exactly what's going on in the moment, we manage to discard the ego and all of a sudden we kind of become aware of a timelessness, uh, an isness, and that is an awareness of God, the guide says. So then this is, I'll read that paragraph. He talks about the genuine God experience. And I'll, uh, I'll read that to you guys. He says, 
a new relationship to God comes into existence. God is experienced as being. I repeat, you cannot come to it if you do not first experience in a negative way that which is now, in, in a sense, the pathwork of, of self-facing. Nor can you come to it by concepts you learn, philosophies and practices you observe, doctrines you follow. And this is the crux of the pathwork, right? If you're unwilling to live through and be in your present community, confusions, errors, and pains, facing and understanding them, you can never, you cannot ever be in God. Or to put it in other words, you cannot be in a state of happiness, peace, creativity without strife, if you do not face the temporary, often unpleasant reality, only then can the great reality be experienced. So um, then the guy talks about prayer, about how we pray, and recapitulates those same stages of the relationship to God in terms of the relationship to prayer. And it's almost really identical um, and then the question is, like, what exactly is prayer? And it turns out that prayer is receptivity to what is right now. He says, candor with oneself is prayer. Alertness to one's resistance is prayer. Owning up to something one is hidden from in shame is prayer. He says, meditation is often the best prayer. And, and what, is, what is that prayer? What is that meditation? It is, quote, meditation by looking at your real motivations, by allowing your actual feelings to come to the surface, by questioning them as to their reasons for being. In this kind of activity, prayer in the old sense becomes more and more meaningless, contradictory. This prayer is the action of self-awareness of looking at yourself in truth. This prayer is a sincere intent to face what may be most unpleasant. It is prayer because it contains the attitude that truth, for the sake of truth is the threshold to love. Without truth and without love, there can be no God experience. So that's the way I summarize the lecture. And um, what do you guys think? Let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, well, um, that specific area you talked about kind of walking away from the image of God that you had or I had as a, as a child and then kind of owning the independent spirit of God by walking away from that image and then starting to have an authentic experience of God, even though I called him by a totally different name. It wasn't the God of my childhood or the thing that I thought I knew from my childhood or the thing that I wanted to belong to as a sense of uh, connectivity. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was more beingness of owning your own path. And I think for me that came as an independence. Um, you know, it came at September 11th, it came watching what I thought was religion <coughs> basically destroying the goodness of things that I knew. And, uh, and, and I was in Japan at the time. And to be honest with you, it was a, a life changing moment where I, I remember leaving Japan and, and, and just praying, I think a, a last prayer to the God that I, I kind of, if he existed, I said to him, you know, um, you'd understand that I need to walk away from you right now, whoever, whatever you represent to me. And I think, uh, at least in this lifetime, I went through the, through those two stages. You're, you you kind of read about that mm -hmm. second stage of atheism moving into an authentic belief because after about five years or six years of running away from him, I realized he really never really left me. Um, and uh, and the entire, and what, what was weird about it is that once I cried and returned to God, with the form of a sort of prodigal son kind of remark. It was an experience of he's here. He's not something of an external authority anymore. You know, it was coming back to myself in, an, in a more authentic way instead of being 
because in my atheism, even though it was independent and, and, and a God experience, it was a very critical God experience for me because it was argumentative about everything. And so uh, I feel like when I read this lecture, Alan, it just, it speaks to me on so many levels. It's unbelievable. So. Yeah, you know, in, in my life of trying to talk to people about the path work and sharing philosophy and views, I've come across a lot of people who say, um, I'm really looking, I want, to find, I want to find the truth, but I do not find it in religion. I do not find it, I'm looking for the answers. And the idea that in your inner reality are the answers in your own understanding of your own conflicts and in your facing up to your negativity, that is where the answer is because that then allows you to feel when the ego starts relaxing, you can deal with the imperfection because he says in, in some part of the lecture, you don't have an urgency. It doesn't have to be fixed right away. You don't have to fix it now, fix it now. And the minute you feel that way, that you can allow your imperfection to be there, hey, there it is. You feel the beginning of this deep feeling of um, just is, isness, the isness of the truth. Rita, Beverly, thoughts? Uh, I'm just trying to understand what you just said. That <laughs> when, you, when you accept your flaws, that what that... You, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. The idea is that everyone is really angry about their flaws. They hate them, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. The idea is that you have to say, I can accept my flaws and I don't have to change them now. I don't like them, but I want to bring them into the light and I want to accept my flaws. And I, I cannot personally, my ego cannot eliminate the flaws. I can't fix the flaws. I cannot cut them out. I kind of deliver them up to my higher self, right? And, and, and I let the lower self come out, but the ego doesn't have the agency, doesn't have the power to fix the problem. Right. So how do you fix the problem? You can't fix the problem. You can't fix the problem. That's right. right. You have to expose it. And I think that all these metaphors about, you know, digging up the dirt, the compost pile, sunlight, I mean, exposing things allows them to be transformed. But exposing them without judgment, without fear, right? Mm -hmm. Without pride, self-will, and fear about the things you expose. Mm -hmm hard to do but I think well you see you see it not as a problem um, when you do finally learn to expose it there is no problem to get rid of because finally you're sitting with the truth even if it used to be an inconvenient truth one that you were scared to bring up or to yeah. liberate or even to self-acknowledge right in your own judgment about the wrongness of your own being and your own reaction therein lies the problem but as soon as you stop seeing your natural state of being in that scenario as being so awful and so wrong, um, suddenly it becomes not only, I guess, you know, people throw around the term, it's an opportunity for forgiveness or it's an opportunity to learn or it's not, and, and that's a great view, but yeah, it's an opportunity to get to know yourself, to really own you know, there, my mom used to say before she passed, there's no shame in the game, Kevin. You know, I mean, she's, and, you know, she's walking around with, you know, adult diapers in her thing. And she's saying, you know, hey, Kev, do you want some? You know, in the middle of, of Pathmark, you know, she, mm -hmm. she's just advertising everything about her because you get to a point where you're like, you know what? This is me. This is me, man. You know, I'm, I'm done trying to justify who I am to myself or to anybody else. And boy, that there ain't no more of a God experience than that. And that's kind of what my atheism represented at that time frame was finally for me to say, look, I'm not going to be underneath the authorities that I felt like I needed to appease, let's say, or be as good as or whatever. So everybody has their own things and I'm sure it goes in their own way. But for me, it was, um, it was, it was a liberating moment to just say, you know what? I am who I am like Popeye. <laughs> like, uh, like George Carlin, 
Right. Well, George, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, exactly. Uh, right out there. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Between two generations, right? He was, yeah. he was smack dab in the middle between two generations, and he, he basically owned it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think you have these two voices competing within the ego and then the other more unified self, where the unified self basically, it's like the concerns the ego has don't mean anything to the unified self. They, they're just not relevant but you kind of shuttle back and forth from one to the other. Uh, and then you, hopefully you spend much more time in the unified self and let the ego get smaller and smaller, let it, let it go. Um, so the ego says you shouldn't be that way, but that's how you are. So you have to accept that's how you are. Um, well, you see this trouble is that the, the resistance to accepting it keeps it keeps it in force keeps it strong the resist the as long as you are um focused on it it's so interesting because in one one of my favorite quotes in the lectures is um the root of the root of evil is excessive self-concern so it's like when it's all about the self things go wrong and the ego is all about itself. The ego is all about, I've got these problems. How can I fix them while pretending that I'm okay and that I'm better than everybody else? How can I get over? And, and it just doesn't work. Um, Tardia, what do you think? What's on your mind? Oh, you're hey. muted. You're, you're muted right now, Tardia. Can you turn your mic on? Oh, wait a second, hold on. Yeah, okay, I did. Oh, yeah. there she is. Okay. Yeah, no, I feel that it's very liberating actually to think about it. If we get to the point where we can say, this is it, this is me with all my uh, defects and everything, but not to try to change them, just say, well, I'm like this for today, and that's all. You don't have to try to make yourself to be something else that you are not. And that, I think, is what, is what the atheism is. The atheism is, I don't believe in anything, God. He's not, I don't care, but I've got myself. And I've got myself warts and all, whatever, whatever BS, but I've got myself. And I can control my life, and I can make things happen in my life. Yeah, well, that's the other extreme. <laughs> then, and then you say, hey, wait a minute. Um, I still have conflicts, and there I have to go. I have to go into the deeper reality. I've got to find more... And the guy keeps talking about that that there are deeper and deeper levels that are accessible if you if you keep on pursuing this uh, path of of uncovering the negative. Mm. Rita, what do you think? Any thoughts? Um, I was. I have to be honest. I didn't read. I didn't get to read the last third of this lecture, and I find this. A little confusing. Is it as simple as we have the uh, the lower self going through the lower self? Well, I mean that is what our task is, um, but it's not it's not simple. Um, at the bottom of page nine, there's a question, and the guide answers it essentially saying that a group of five seekers who are honestly looking. Um, is more powerful to help the world than a whole i have to i don't want to quote than any kind of a belief system i mean something like that right so yeah is that the basis of this lecture talking about just what we're doing right now saying i think it certainly is i think it certainly is talking about that Well, the, yeah. He says, a group like yours contributes more than vast masses of people who preach doctrines, who force away the emotions, who feel they must be good while their state of being is removed from such goodness. A group of only five people who face reality as it happens to be now contributes more to the entire world, not only to your earth sphere, but to all spheres than the best intended teachings and ideals that reach merely the surface intellect. Well, that is a wonderful, a wonderful um, paragraph, don't you think? Isn't that? It's really awesome. 
Yeah. So I'm, I am just seeing this particular part of the lecture as we're talking and it seems to be exactly what's going on this very second. <laughs> That's great insight. <laughs> yeah. Sid, what are your thoughts? Any thoughts? Old path work friend? Um, I think the pull to, to find the outside authority to solve issues for you is very strong. When you, I think the way to, to let that go is to relax into the energy of God. I think there is an energy stream that we all have access to inside ourselves. And that that is a, is a stream that can take us to different levels of reality. Right, and that's a, that's a stream that the ego really doesn't know anything about. I think that- The, the ego can open the door, I think. Yeah. But, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if there's a higher, if, 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 is there a higher conscious being in addition to the stream? Well, you know, the guy talks about God in a kind of paradoxical way, complicated way sometimes, right? Yeah. And the God, God sometimes implies that God is an energy current. Yes. An energy current, and it could be used for any purpose, right? And then the guide, the guide talks about personality and Jesus Christ and God the Father. So kind of these two themes run through the lectures. Yes, yeah, true. God is, right? God is the energy current. Um, God is a powerful force. And then God is sort of an organizing intelligence. And then, you know, God, the creator, and, and Jesus Christ having some of this, the same substance as God, a greater quality and then a greater amount than anyone else. But I, I, in this, this lecture, of course, God is impersonal, right? I mean, and you know, you shouldn't pray to God. God doesn't, as, as, they, as I've heard it said, God doesn't need your prayers. Um, but the idea, the real prayer is for us to stay on our paths and continue with our tasks as how facing. That's the most important and significant prayer, I think. And then when we pray, as the guide says, when we, what we were doing is we're meditating. And we're meditating on our dedication to this process, to the unfoldment of ourselves. Yeah, but there's nothing in the lecture, this one, about God having any kind of a personality. Would, would, the, would the God... Would the God consciousness be a projection of our own? Well, it seems that the guide says that, that the guide says that the, the concept that we built up we build up of God is basically a mental and it's a defense against um, just going with the flow and being real and being in the, in the moment. It is a, it is a creation of our egos. It is a creation of our, um, basically our, our ego is trying to work things out. And so it creates a God that the ego can bargain with, deal with, as he, as he puts it, that we can conjole or propitiate. And as to what the real nature of God is, in this lecture, I think it's somewhat obscure. <laughs> yeah, but I was just wondering if we, if we, I know that you talk about negatively transferring into, into creating a God, but if you can also, if there's a positive transference that would actually be an experience of your own God self. Right, right. Well, I know that Sid, in your experience, you more energetics and as a pathwork helper, you know, you, You've served with that energy current many times. I know that that's a very big part of your life. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Frank, if, what's, what's on your mind? Well, I was just thinking uh, <clears throat> what you were saying about prayer. Um, kind of changes the whole concept, at least in my life, um, brain, seeing the two different venues that you pointed out, 
So I don't know, maybe you have to uh, touch on this again. If you're saying I can't pray for somebody else because that will interfere in their path. Let's try to figure out what the guide is saying about prayer. Um, I think that the guide always says that a loving and positive intent to another person is a good thing and that helps them and that produces value. I mean, and of course, in the guide lectures, in the sessions that you remember Sid and Marion, the guide, we, we would, would give the force, a force of blessing to whoever needed it at That's right. the event. So that was a powerful blessing and a powerful force. Um, so, so certainly a blessing for somebody and a prayer to give love and energy to somebody else's value is valid and that has meaning. Um, but let's look at what the guide says about prayer. Oh, and what do you think, Tracy? Do you want to weigh in on, on the concept here? What the guide what the guide is saying about prayer? Should we go to the lecture and look at the question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Marion, you know your camera's off. Oh, I, I, hi, this is Marion. Can you hear me? I yeah. can hear you, but I can't I can see hear you. you. I know because I, I, I gave Alan that note. I don't have a camera or a mic on my uh, computer. So I can see all of you, but you cannot see me. And I talk <laughs> through my phone. <laughs> so I give a flags up when I want to share. I and Alan will see that. Oh, I think so. I'm a little new to the platform, though. But you know, you, you should just talk if you if I don't see the flag, Marion. Okay, or I I just unmute uh, with a uh, a star nine, and you would get a notice. But anyway, I'll be okay. I get to see all your beautiful faces. All right. Let's take a look at at the question and the answer about prayer. Here it is. I'll read it. Will you please elaborate on the meaning of prayer in the different stages? Prayer will be adapted to the conscious attitude and concept of any given phase. In the first stage, when man is so almost in the state of being without awareness, there is no prayer because there is no God concept. In the next stage, when man begins to ask questions and wonder, in this spontaneous experience of wondering and allowing new considerations to fill him, this is in itself a prayer or meditation. So the next stage may be the realization of a supreme intelligence. In this stage, prayer takes the form of admiration of the marvel of the universe and nature. It is worship. Right, we under, that's so far so good, right? And the idea being that mm -hmm. one has a worshipful, prayerful attitude toward nature, that's a form of prayer. Okay, then at this point, then the confusion sets in because after the stage of being awed by nature and worshipful, then one has to deal with one's own immaturity and inadequacy, the fear the dependence, the wishful thinking, the desire to have a God that will, will fix everything for us, the flight from our own self-responsibility. So then um, it's kind of interesting. What the guide says is then in that stage, you still may pray and your prayers may be answered. Let's say that you pray for a good job or let's say that you pray that a friend of yours uh, might recover from their illness. But at the same time, you have a positive intent and you go out and you get the good job, or you help your friend, and you, you, you recommend a good doctor and the friend gets better. The prayer, he says, when prayers seem to be answered in this state, it is not because God acts, but because in some way man is sincere, in spite of all his self-deceptions and evasions, has thus opened a channel within through which laws of being can penetrate to him. Does that make sense, Frank? In other words, yeah. you're sincerely desiring yeah. something, you're praying for it, and, and it happens. But it's because you have made it happen with your positive intent, he says. It's not that God answered your prayer, it's that you were able 
to, to, to give in, to embody a sincere desire for something constructive and, and valuable. Then he says, again, when prayers seem to be answered in this state, it is not because God acts, but because in some way man is sincere in spite of all his self-deceptions and evasions and has thus opened a channel within through which loss of being can penetrate to him. This is an important distinction that will only be perceived as a, at a later stage. When man realizes his own participation in whether or not a prayer is answered, he will lose the sense of helplessness and of the arbitrariness of a willful God he has to appease by man-made and superimposed rules. But I might also add that what often appears like an answered prayer is the strength of an unconflicted mind in the particular area where the prayer is answered, at least at that time. So that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, yeah. if I pray for a better circumstance at my job, and at the same time, I'm disciplined and I'm focused, and I get up, I get to work at nine, and I, I, you know, I just take a short lunch, and I, I do, I act responsibly, and then, you know, I get, uh, I get a promotion, or, the, or I get the job, and I get a raise. It's not so much that I prayed for it and that God acted, but that I was able to channel my positive intent to make it happen. Right. Right. So then, then where we are is that when man comes into the state of independence, now that's the state of independence where you feel your own power. He lets go of the imaginary God who punishes rewards and leads life for him. When he finds himself, and then he finds himself in the state of atheism, and when he, when he finds himself, if he does, in the state of atheism, of denial of any higher being, he doesn't pray, at least not in a conventional sense. He may meditate on himself. He may look at himself in sincerity. And this, as you all know by now, is the best prayer in the true sense. But it may also be that man, in the atheistic state, is completely irresponsible and fails to think and look at himself he may escape from himself the same way as the person who uses God as an escape from himself. So, so far, so good, right, Frank? Yeah, no, very good. Then, then you reach the next stage. And I, I dare say that in this stage, the active pursuit of self-awareness of facing ourselves, you know, I must say, in some sense, we unify with God then. We become God then. And, and our meditation and our self-facing and our own ability to, to uncover negativity, transform it, we, we live in prayer. And that means we affect other people in a positive way. We draw more positive things to us. Right. And we're able to cope with what befalls us without anger and blame. Mm -hmm. I guess I kind of, you know, in the final stage, the guy talks about um, prayer and meditation. In this, in this kind of activity, prayer in the old sense becomes more and more meaningless, contradictory. Instead, prayer is the action of self-awareness and of looking at yourself in truth. His prayer is the sincere intent to face what may be most unpleasant. It is prayer because it contains the attitude that truth for the sake of truth is the threshold to love. Yeah. I'm uh, kind of reminded of Governor Cuomo, you know, in his um, daily briefings, where he says that New York tough is also loving. Yeah, I like that. He just had to say that, right? That's like, he goes, it's not, it's not, you know, silly to say you're loving. It's not, it's not dumb, it's strong. And uh, so, I mean, I would say that's a prayer. What, that's a prayer. And it's a prayer backed up by the determination to do what, what, what's the truth and do what's right. Yeah, yeah, you stopped short, Alan, of, of hitting the part that I highlighted. Um, that, that that was culminating in in the lecture it says candor with oneself is prayer and um yeah kind of owning up to uh 
to everything, everything that exists in your state of being. Um, mm. As soon as you can, and I'm not saying I'm there, but as soon as one can open one's eyes in those instances and not point the finger um, or beg for help or um, but when re one rather owns the situation um, as it is, um, then, then I think that those words really come, come, come to light. And, and it's timeless, it's weightless, I feel, in that instant when, you're, when, you're, when you can um, connect in that way. Um, the other line here is, uh, love cannot grow out of trying to pretend a truth that is not felt. Uh, that is just enormous. Um, but love can grow out of facing a truth no matter how imperfect it is. Yeah. So all of those intercessory prayers that we beg God to take away an imperfect um, situation uh, often is our desire not to face them. Uh, and, and really the, the imperfections of those situations um, in a metaphysical sense may very well be arising based upon our desire not to face ourselves. I mean, I was walking with fear when I had fever, you know? I mean, I have fever and I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm alone in my apartment. I've got like a <laughs> relatively high fever. And is this it? And I said to myself, you know, I can just walk with it. I, I can walk with the fear. Right. I can walk with it. It's all right. I can, and it felt better to just kind of not have a plan. Right? Um, hmm. Yeah. And, and you know what you said, Kevin, about about the truth of the moment. Uh, I'm just reminded of a pathwork group. Uh, my dad was in the pathwork group and there was some, you know, we used to have these groups up in the center and people would work on stuff and it was pretty emotional. And, uh, you know, my dad was really crying a lot about something that was going on. And I went up to him as, after the group said, dad, you know, um, I know you really didn't care about this person that much and it wasn't a big deal. So why are you crying so much? He said, well, he said to me that he basically identified with something in his life where he was very sad and he cried because of that and not because of what was actually going on, you know, like a method act, but he felt that he had to do it. But that was alienating from your own self because it wasn't the truth of the moment, you know? kind of doing what you, you feel, your ego feels you have to do or you, you should do. Yeah, yeah, I find that with being a parent many times I'm challenged with um, finding myself in the moment going, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> what, what did I just, what came out of my mouth with my children? Oh my God, you know, and, and it's kind of, you know, I mean, even kids, they're like, they're like litmus, they're, they're like so clear. Um, responders to what's untruthful right where you know dad you're telling me not to do this but you do this yourself you know they're, they're they can easily sense hypocrisy in a parent and as uh, trying to work in the path work it starts to really open myself up to realize that you know my children are some of my greatest or one of the greatest gifts that i have in my life these these younger souls in order to show me my truth in that moment um, when I'm not able to see it for myself. Any other thoughts? A couple of folks on the phone that I, that I don't see who they are because you guys are just there as like, um, you know, icons. Hi, Alan. This is Ellen. Ellen. Hi, Ellen. I Hi. Hi, Hi, yeah, I'm on the phone. I called in and I'm so happy to have made it. I had I had some technical difficulties here, but I'm but I'm <laughs> just so so happy to be here. So hello everybody. Very glad you're here. Thank you. Who else do we have? Hey guys, it's Phil. How are you doing? Hey Phil, what's happening? Hey, Phil. A long time, man. Great to see you, Phil. <laughs> Such a great uh conversation man thank you so much it's amazing all right friends it's so good to feel the um you know what you said rita about um five people getting together and trying to delve deep having so much more power than uh 
a lot of folks locked in just false assumptions and BS. It's such a wonderful feeling to, I feel like we're on a spaceship kind of flying around, flying on a mission like Starship Enterprise. But, um, good feeling. It's a very good feeling to be, to have the comradeship uh, with you all. Any other thoughts? This is Marion. May I share? Of course. Um, there's so much in this lecture that is very supportive. I'm grateful for it being brought into the meeting. And because at this time, I, I live alone. And uh, in the lecture, I, th I have a very old lecture, so it may not be on the same page as everybody else's, but it's after the question, will you elaborate on the meaning of prayer in the different stages? So it's more toward the last, the last of that question. And certain uh, words uh, jump out, and you said them also, Alan, and it's the word intent, because I'm always thinking of the lecture that all of these lectures have little arrows going to other lectures for me, like recreation of childhood hurts, the personality types, because how we look at ourselves is going to depend on our dominant personality type, and also uh, the power of the word, because intent is there. Um, and like he said, his prayer is the action of self-awareness and of looking at himself in truth. His prayer is his seer intent. And that word in doing core energetics and in reading uh, certain lectures have all have vibration. And the word intention I have found is a very powerful word, so I don't use it loosely. Uh, it's because it does vibrate within the energy system and it does uh, open up the whole system. So when I get to the point of observing a lot and get to the word intention, I ask a powerful question only because uh, with my in word intention, because then I know I am receptive to a powerful answer. And those powerful answers, of course, come intuitively. And so that part of the lecture is so clear. And uh, some a few years ago, I set the intention to live in the eternal now and release my past. And I did not do that with a lot of uh, work, having gone you know, decades of work. Little did I know what is there from my past would come up and right in my face and slap me in the face, and I didn't know that. So that's why I'm very careful of how I use words, because all of my past traumas, anything stored in my cellular memory that I have not totally cleared has been there. I had to go into post-traumatic stress disorder therapy, uh, having flashbacks from trauma in childhood and through a very painful marriage. And so here it is, you know, um, right here in the, in the lecture. And so it brought me back to my knees of employing the tools of the pathwork. So I'm so grateful for all the tools of the pathwork and the energy work because then going over to the next page after, would you comment please on the progress of our group work? That next question, next question the guide has so many, I have a, a short phrase that I use and use with my clients. The first step of transformation is observation. Those are the, those are the guide's words. So in there is all this about observe. Learn, you know, too often you, you do not see yourself. You don't want to expose yourself, so we know that. But then it says learn to observe your own reactions. Observe your tendency of always explaining your reactions away. Observe your subjectivity. And it goes on and on. And so in this lecture is a very powerful tool that is so essential that when I look at my outer life and it reflects to me where I'm still holding on to demanding that my children and my grandchildren and those I love the most show up the way I want them to be, that I'm still so attached to them. And that for me to be free, I have to be released from that and I can't figure it out. It has to be surrender, but that observing. So during this time here, I did hit some of those places of where People weren't showing up the way I want them to be. And that I, I just walked around my apartment and I was saying out loud, I want to be loved. I want to be loved by somebody. I want to be loved. And there was no opposition to that voice coming up. I didn't know where it was going to happen, where I was going. But I knew that beside me was a presence, a presence with me. And so this observation at some point is always turned over to higher power, to God, to the God self, or else there is no transformation. So 
I, I love this lecture about get, putting those tools in there because it says you cannot gain the self-awareness you wish and which is so essential for your liberation without beginning observing, not trying to do anything, observing, staying with it. But another shortcut that the guide gave is you cannot do this because it's dissolving images. And this expression I put in quotes, the hand of God. You can't do it alone. It is always the hand of God. So that deeper level that the guide talks about in your meditation it is, is, a, yeah. is a very strong prayer. Yeah. So I'm so grateful that during this time I have all these tools. Thank you. Well, that also brings up the uh, daily review as a tool and the helper worker session as a tool and what the guide used to say about image finding themes, you know, that you can talk to somebody that you know well and expose your own images and discuss and hopefully we can do that in our in our relationships, our intimate relationships, you know, with the person that we care, our significant others. Um, I'm lucky, my girlfriend. Uh, she's she likes the path work. She's I wouldn't say she's um, ready to take sessions, but she understands and she gets with it. And I can talk about my images. So, observing is difficult when you completely do it all yourself. And that's what you said, Marion. That you need the hand of God and you need tools to to do those observations and uh, to ground yourself in them. Mary, was the, 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 the intention to be loved, Are you? do you think that's addressing yourself? To love yourself? Yes, it was me. It was me walking around my apartment saying it. I want to be loved. I want somebody to love me. And I realized it took so much so much ego was gone in that. There was no self-judgment. There was no figuring it out, no analysis. It was a total allowing with a power and presence walking with me. And I allowed it not knowing where I'm going, what's the outcome. And it sounded like so early, so early in my life and now. And so I did not analyze it because I didn't need to do that. I needed to just keep allowing. And there was, I received a, a very deep uh, healing uh, one night and uh, took several days and then in shifting because this is not new work but this that coming up at this time of this isolation i it was a blessing but i i could not rationalize anything away and say oh it's a blessing here oh this will go away no it was being in that but always that presence was walking with me through my apartment do you and feel more self-loving as a result what? Do you feel more self-loving? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use those words exactly. All I noticed was a shift, a shift in that one person that I, because I was holding also resentments, but even before the the pandemic, toward my most loved ones. <laughs> and I've got a son and a daughter and four grandsons. None of them were showing up the way I want them to be. And these are my deepest loves. So this isn't new. This is because there's a split in my family, in this family, that I made sure my children had a father that they loved. And this was the person who abused me. So if you can imagine raising two children in that way and what kind of, where that draws me, you know? So that is not totally uh, integrated in me yet. There's still some of that split because they haven't done the work I've done. So they're still playing out some of that split of the um, divided loyalties between father and mother. So I can't tear their masks off. I have to really accept them where they are. And that can't come through, oh, I accept you. It means me releasing my own, what came up in me. So I, I just found more of, more of a shift with them. Oh, that's good. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Phil, you had a thought? Is that correct? Did you raise your hand? Uh, no, I didn't. But um, I really appreciate what you're talking about. And um, I'm kind of resonating with um, the idea of barriers and getting behind the mask, uh, self-observation. And it seems, I was thinking to myself, I think there's also a stage, maybe as a youngster, or there seems to be an essence, and then we kind of imitate to get along in the world. Mm. And then um, 
for me anyway, I had to get behind that. So everything is really resonating and uh, really appreciate the honesty. Well, in a sense, you know, the, the development of, the, of, a, of a person kind of recapitulates this four stages, right? I mean, the, the little baby has no choice just to survive. Then when one is older, like three or four, I think one starts to feel wonderment and amazement about the world. And then when one gets older, one starts, like my uh, ex-wife, who was a high school principal, she said, um, uh, well, you know, in the second grade, they really think they hate each other. In the third grade, they know they do. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. that the anger, you know, all the stuff starts boiling up and bubbling up, right? And then you have the conflicts that you there, and now we're on the path of trying to resolve. So, yeah, that innocence and wonderment of a child is a wonderful thing. That's certainly true. Hey, Rita, did you have some thoughts? I think you raised your hand. Am I wrong? Yeah. Um, what is... Ma uh, it's a question for Marion. Um, I think that at every uh, meeting we've had, you've mentioned with the hand of God. So I wanted to ask what does that mean in terms of where in the lectures we could find um, more about that? Uh, hi, I'm on. You know, I don't know where that is. And of course, you know, quoting without having it in front of me is always a little bit, you know, like questionable, like I need to find that. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember for so many decades using it and putting quotes around it because it was a metaphor. And it's individual for everybody what your hand of God is, depending on your spiritual practice. And uh, so I, I think when the guide somewhere said that with the hand of God, uh, meaning you, don't, you do not work on an image alone. Sure. And you don't work on dissolving an image by yourself mm -hmm. and you go for a helper, you know, you go for somebody alive, you know, but it's because of needing somebody standing with you. And so I don't know, because I'd have to start reading the lectures one to 358, I guess, to look for some of these things. But mm -hmm. that always I used it. I always used it like, what's your hand of God? How do you hold the hand of God? You know, and ask questions of people because it's so individual. But I don't know, maybe somebody will come across that. You know, I'm, there is a Pathwork uh, like the Word Search website. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Which is very, very useful. Uh -huh. Sure. Very, very helpful. Very yeah, useful. you should send a that guy, around. A guy in, okay. in Holland, I'll send it out to everybody. Guy in Holland set it up. If you just Google Pathwork. Pathwork like word lecture search. number 254, it comes up as 254, 255. Oh, you found yep. it, Rita. Yeah. Boom. Yep. One, um, yeah. Yeah, 26 and 8 254 also have is the it. first one, surrender. Yeah, 8 has it and 26 as well. Uh-huh, 254, 255. Um, 254, 255, what else? Any earlier ones? What did eight, you say? Uh, 8, 8. Number 8. Yeah. Okay. Number 8 and number 6. 6. What's the website, Alan? Well, if you Google Pathwork Lectures Word Search, you'll find it. Okay. Okay. Uh, a gentleman in Holland that set it up, and it really works well. Is that the oh, original index? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. It, it, it's an index by word. In other words, every single word, you can see wherever it occurs in a particular right. lecture. Remember wow. Michael Bradley's yeah. It's very cool. Nice. Um, I just put it into chat for everyone if you want to grab it from there. All right. Yeah. Oh, thank okay. you. Thank you. Because there's another one that I want to look for where the guide mentions um, it's not a part of the lecture. So I will do that. But it's about you can recreate your childhood. And I used to think very early on that meant going to therapy and talk about things, go to your helper and all that until I had the experience of recreating a scene from my childhood and I recreated it mm -hmm. actually. That's so, and I need to find that. So as I use it in my writing, I can quote it. That's the actual name of the lecture. What is it? This is what you get when you put me in front of a computer. Yeah. So I'll, I'll search for that. Recreating childhood hurts. That's like 
compulsion to recreate and overcome. Is that 73? Yeah. Yeah, it may, because I've searched a lot, and it was not in the theme, I don't think, of the title of the lecture, but I'll look at that. It was a paragraph, kind of an aside, that the guide put in a lecture, but my memory can be off, you know, about that. So I'll search. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my good friend, um, does anyone else want to share? Shall we have meditation? Or what do you guys feel? What do you guys want to do? Meditation would be wonderful. All right. So I will read. Um, what what, what, what time are we here? ending? What time are we ending? Well, um, it's kind of flexible. Usually, okay. you know, we could end uh, after the meditation if you like, or maybe even after the meditation if we want to come back and talk about some more we can. Tracy, what are your thoughts? Whatever, I'm, I'm here for whatever anybody wants to do. I, 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 it's not exactly like I have to go out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of us are going anywhere. It's that story. Exactly. <laughs> no, whatever everybody wants is fine. Tracy, is Joel okay? Yeah, he is. He's, um. We, we had a little bit of a problem with uh, 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 the, the, the townhouse where we live here. There was like flooding in the lobby and a man came tonight, a plumber, to try and we're trying to like um, figure out what the, where the flooding has come. So unfortunately, nobody's here except for us. Everybody else has left um, wow. onto like, you know, summer homes and stuff. So it's us taking care of the, of the building. So he had to go with this man but he's i can hear that they're just about finishing so i suspect he's gonna he's gonna be joining me in a minute and he'll get right into the meditation i'm sure anyway he's here and he's fine but he's dealing with the flood Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. when it when it rains it pours no pun intended yeah <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read the uh, one of the last paragraphs of the lecture, and then um, does somebody want to give us an intention for a meditation? Anyone have feel inspired to do that? Maybe we can meditate on the deep lessons of this lecture, and on what true prayer is. All right, I will read this and then we'll meditate for 10 minutes. How's that sound? Oh, wonderful. Sounds great. Right. Sounds good. My dearest friends, I leave you but for a short time. This does not mean that the continued process of inner growth need be halted. It depends on how you approach yourself, your daily experiences, reactions, feelings. Keep up the self-observation no matter what. Do not stop it. Do not run away from yourself. Bring peace into your own heart by looking at yourself as you are now. There is no other real way of gaining peace, but there are many false illusory ways. Most of you have experienced this at least occasionally. Your lack of peace is always due to somewhere not wanting to face yourself. Remember this, and as you do, and more and more dissolve your pride, pretense, and resistance, you will perceive what it means to be in reality, to be in the state of being and awareness, even the unpleasant reality of the moment, the product of your conflicts and confusions, if you truly face and live it, instead of running away from it, even that reality is peaceful. It is God. Only that can be the door to an eventually greater reality.
Thank you, my friends. Tracy, do you have any thoughts about the next lecture? That, not about the next lecture yet, um, but I think I was thinking about the Friday before Memorial Day weekend for the next lesson, for the next meeting. Does somebody know what that Friday is? The, the Friday before the Memorial Day weekend. I believe that's the 22nd. Okay, Does that, if that works for you. Yeah. And, Wait a second. And then I'll uh, I'll get back to you, Alan, about what the lecture. All right. Does that work for you, Matt, Alan? May twenty second. Sure. Okay. I was going to be at the Pathwork Conference in Canada, but that's been canceled. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll be able to do it in person. What we'll see one day at a time. Uh, Memorial Day is the twenty fifth, so you're saying the Friday before that, the twenty second. Oh, I was thinking the Friday before the Friday Memorial oh, the Day Friday weekend. That's Friday. what I thought. Because that would be the fifteenth. The fifteenth, yeah. 15th is that fun. is that is that three weeks from tonight? Um, I believe it is. Okay. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Very good. And listen, we, yeah. we should all be with each other on email if we need anything and reach out. We'll have everyone's email addresses, right? So uh, we should all stay in touch spiritually. Yes. We will. Yes. Yeah, be safe. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yes, yes. Everybody. Be safe. Yeah. Tracy, can I get some of your antibodies, maybe? Yeah, yeah I've got, I must have a lot of them. Well, you have your own now. Ship them around. I would say you have your own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> may, may I say one personal thing to Alan for everybody? This is Marion. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't going to say this, but when I saw that, behind you, the scene behind you, Alan, of the Pathwork Mokwe. Yeah. And I wasn't gonna say anything, but then you used the word in your beginning, something about putting something in the compost mm -hmm. tonight when you were talking about the lecture. And my memory is of you and me working in the organic garden and uh, you uh, a teenager and me, a kind of young, young one, young older work person. And we did composting together. We put all the weeds and all the leaves yeah. and everything in a wheelbarrow and went down that, mm -hmm. that road there, down probably across the grass and up the path to the garden and put it in the compost. That was our job for a while. So yeah, I just had to say that tonight. Because <laughs> you used the word. I didn't. <laughs> so the memory came up. Thank you. Thank all of you. You're, it's wonderful to see you and be with you. Hmm. Thank you. Same here for everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Great yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank, thank you. you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Be safe, everyone. everyone. Okay. Be well. God bless. God bless, yes. Mm -hmm. God bless. Okay.